Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here. I'm really glad to see all of you. Um, I'm very grateful, and I'll return to the gratitude. Um, this novel, Before All the World, um, follows two Yiddish-speaking immigrants from a fictional shtetl, a fictional village called Zatelsk in northeastern Ukraine. Um, they make their way to Philadelphia of the 1930s after a pogrom, a massacre in which everyone in the village is killed except for the two of them, Leib and Gittel. And in Philadelphia, um, at the end of Prohibition, they meet Charles, a black communist writer. And the three of them navigate America's nightmarish sexual and racial politics. So that's the blurb. <laughs> and I'm done. <laughs> um, and no, an important thing to talk about in the context of this book today is that the book is framed as a translation. So Gittel, one of the two um, immigrants from Zatelsk, is the author of the novel, of the book. And Charles uh, is the translator. And before I start in on a bit of reading, I'll tell a quick story. So um, folks have told me, uh, folks wiser than me, to stay off Goodreads. <laughs> um, and you know, I plan to stay off Goodreads, but the best laid plans of mice and authorlets. Um, so I thought, you know, I'd just peek in to see what people are saying, early reviews a few days before publication. And so I open up Goodreads, and there's a one-star review. I say, OK. And they even left a comment. Um, and in this one-star review, they wrote, not an enjoyable reading experience. I'm paraphrasing. Not an enjoyable reading experience. Couldn't follow it. I wonder if the issue was with the translation. <laughs> um, and so, I'll, so we'll, we'll, we'll hold that comment in our, in our mind as I begin reading. So the first section, I'll give you a sense of what they might have been talking about. This is um, the first paragraph of the first full chapter. It goes like this. On his first time at crickets, Leib stood only at the edges of the room, overwatching the men what impiled there every Shabbos evening in Philadelphia. And what seemed to Leib not so much Americanish or even men, but rather as a single sun-warmed river, yo. And Leib imagined submerging into this ever-moving clamor of bodies and finding there only quiet, and he felt the surges of his taive urge and urge and urge, as Walt would have it, and wanted for his taive to merge into one of the many mouths of the cricket's river of grasping and stroking and drinking and howling and gasping in trumpets and smoke. But he found no such opening, and so remains cornersome and dryish, and he waited until crickets began to fold into itself and become in preparation for the six days of the week what followed, once again, a place of nothingness, an emptyish building, yo, yeah, or perhaps a sock shop, and then Leib to home went alone. So I actually find it kind of moving, this Goodreads comment, um, in a strange way, that there is a generosity of imagination to this comment. Uh, maybe not a generosity of starring on Goodreads. It's one out of five stars, if folks don't know the Goodreads forum. But a generosity of imagination that this reader thought that perhaps th the translation wasn't working for them, but perhaps somewhere out there, there is a magnificent Yiddish original. And perhaps that magnificent Yiddish original, there something would be working, if only, if only this reader could get their hands on the Yiddish original. And so these are problems of translation that come up not only in an extra textual, in an extra textual, extra textual sense, but in the text itself. Um, so the next short sec section I want to read to you is a conversation between, between Gittel and Charles about the act of translation. And uh, to give a few more codes about how I'm reading, um, when I do this, it's a footnote. Um, and when I do this, it is the voices of the Molochim, the, the angels, the spirits of Gittel and Leib's murdered siblings who speak in italics and indented on the page. Don't worry about it. So footnotes, Molochim. <laughs> um, and here, this is toward the end of the book. The book doesn't work. Time in this book is not a linear thing. Uh, this is toward the end, but it's before other things that happen. Um, and here, Gittel and Charles are talking about questions of translation. How about Zetelsk? What? Should Zetelsk be capitalized in American? Yeah. 
Why? Gittel shrugged. Maybe a dust village is more like a person than a god. How about Philadelphia, then? You decide. Is your Philadelphia more like a person or a god? Well, what's a god, comrades? A false hope? I'll drink to that. And a person? A thing made from maices and taive and the small choices of each moment. Charles nodded. All right, one more question while we're on the subject. A malich, yo, nu, vus, Charles, is an angel, yes? Gittel shook her head. Angel is a god word. Maybe better sibling, better sibling, better a sibling, oh wah. A sibling with his avek. And the malich made from only eyes, also a sibling? No, but it can choose at any time its own humanish collaborators, Gittel said. So perhaps it could choose labele, or also I, also me. Yeah, also you it could choose. No, I meant, never mind. I tend to wax a bit pedantic, which is what I like about this Maisegit, the warts and welts, if I may. It felt corrective to the deadly puritanical neatness of this place, which I've inherited despite our mutual loathing. It's truly hellacious, Gittel, this place, the way it sinks its glistening teeth into my flesh at every opportunity, but also simultaneously wends its way between my own teeth, into my mouth, onto my tongue, my pen. I think that's why I winced like I did at your comment about the semicolon. But maybe it's more than just semicolons versus commas, or tall letters versus short ones. Maybe there's something ultimately freer about Yiddish, something that can't be oversat into American. No. All tongues are the same upground human fish, I think. There is no such holy mama tongue which helps any person to do anything, or to be anything, or what keeps a person from anything. Also, if we're oversitting here into American all the way, Yiddish just is Jewish, and Jewish with a small letter, yo. But of course, Charles said. What else? So in this next section, I'm going to read to you a piece that comes earlier in the, in the book, but later in the manuscript. Um, so in this section, Gittel and Charles are discussing how to translate a story, um, a memoir, a reflection that Gittel wrote about leaving Minsk, leaving central Belarus, and coming to Philadelphia 14 years after the pogrom. And in this section, Gittel has, has written a list. She's written a list um, of people in Zatelsk, of other people in the village. And for this list, she decided she would try to give at least one, a one-line maise, a one-line story for each person. So the list starts off like this. It starts, starts off, Chayele temerals, mamashi what made forest blessings, what like rodents were hard to vanquish, burichdayen ho'emes, blessed be the judge of truth. Omein, omein, but what were vanquished, omein, but not her fault, mamashi ours, awa. Ephraim Fischl Genendels, Tatashi what slaughtered for funds and tongues, but never for own eating, Burichdayen Oemis, Omein, what had strong hands, Omein, what wept sometimes when he slaughtered, Omein, Tatashi ours, Owa. And the list goes on and on until it starts to devolve into something that's more like this. Son Rifkes, what Gittel could not remember how he was called, Burichdayen Oemis, was in Cheder with me, but we cannot tell you, only reinforce you, and if already you forgot, then it is forgotten. Owa, Omein. Son Rifkes, yo, youngest, 301 other Jews is too many Jews to know how they are all named, Burichdayen Oemis, Omein, Omein, Omein. It's okay, Gittel sibling ours, it's okay, Omein, Owa. And from there, it devolves into a list that sounds like this. Another Jew which wasn't alive anymore, unrecognizable to Gittel. Burichdayen ho emes, omein, 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 owa Gittel. Another Jew which wasn't alive anymore, a body. Burichdayen ho emes, omein, 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 omein. Another Jew which wasn't alive anymore. Burichdayen ho emes, omein, 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 omein. We are always with you, Gittel. Another Jew which wasn't alive anymore. Burichdayen ho emes, omein, 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 omein. And onwards for 296 other names. And so Gittel writes this list. She makes her way to Minsk, a few dozen kilometers north of Zatelsk. And there she finds a job cleaning floors for a journal called Literarische Blumen, or Literary Flowers, um, which is nicknamed Marx's Beard. Um, she, as she puts it, she begins to stip a man named Meishke there, and then gets bored of him. 
But one evening, uh, Meshke is there and under Gittel's bed mat finds these pages, asks if he can publish them in Marx's beard for an issue commemorating the events, the, the events of the Russian Revolution 14 years prior. And Gittel says, I should care where you place it, so long as you back bring the pages. Yo, if you do not, we will kindly help your revolutionary, jargon-filled head, revolute until backward facing upon the stalk of your neck, Owa. And so he took them and he brought them back. And Gittel and Meishke stipped maybe twice or four more times until Gittel grew bored and away sent Meishke into the wilderness of Minsk. And Gittel returned to the toilets and floors of the beard and she ignored him when he tried to grab her attention there with psts and other pesters. And then one time she turned toward the pist sound peeking from this pisher's pisk, slubber de gullion's craw, and said, Yo, Meishkele, a beautiful thanks. I'd love to come for dinner by you and your shoshkele. Monogamy is the bailiwick of the bourgeoisie, not so. And the other editors horse laughed with their big teeth, and Meishke red flushed, and then that was that, yo. Yeah. Until maybe two or four months later, when a letter arrived at the offices of Literarische Blumen, and Meishke himself brought it to Gittel, which was of course not expecting any letter so ever, because of how all the people what she knew were away, taking, away taken to the forest, etc., but was not displeased to see Meishke's face so grum and coyfish when he told her it was addressed to her. And she took it from his hand and saw that her name was indeed scrawled on its outside, but that it had been opened, lilacish seal overbroken, and she spit lightly near Meishke's nice shoes and then long looked at Meishke, and he away looked for shame, but did not leave, and so she reopened the already opened envelope and saw that in it was a document declaring that she, Gittel Chayelez, had been awarded passage into America. Hurrah! And Meishke, having already read its contents, murmured then that no one got such things these days, then began to explain about the quota's jaws, but Gittel offcut him and said, Yo, I know. I do read every now and then a famous journal, what's called Literary Flowers. And she looked down at the Americanish welcome paper in her hand and noticed that attached to its back was a notelet in Jewish, which she overturned and read. Dear Chayle's daughter, I liked your little poem. Why don't you come to America? Come, declaim your little poem for the poor neglected Jews here. And it was signed, The Baroness. And Gittel looked at Meishke, with ga gazed howlishly with a certain sort of taive at the papers in her hands. Yo, unimportant is Meishke's jealous fish. Isn't he anyway supposed to scoff upon America's golden toenails? Marx's beard, indeed. Anyway, Gittel, let's already. An after Misa is waiting. Oh, wah. And Gittel laughed without smiling and nodded her head and bid him farewell with a finger tap on his fleecesome forearm and a hand pat on his smooth shaken chikale. And then she, Gittel Chayelez, took the money which she had saved and also a little extra from the office, what for a socialistic tip. And she sprinkled it into the Atlantisher's open jaws and the water chickled to itself, distracted by its newfound fortune. And so when Gittel was 31 years old, she left her home continent and its ever humming river of death and went into the ocean. And there she enjoyed outspitting each of her own mices into the waters. And lo, the waters responded by upcasting their salt over her flesh and her eyes, such that her gums became coated with salt, and her eyelashes stuck together, and her memories overcrusted and became grains of salt, and were dispersed throughout the waters and the there waters of the past and the present. And Gittel grew tired and thought she might begin her undergoing and come finally to rest in the chvalies, this word, which is, of course, the name of Comrade Trunksboim's press in which this Maise first found its home stands in particularly stark oral contradistinction to its American nasal honk of a cousin waves and echoes at least to my ear the aforementioned Chliope. But she was just then propped up by porpoises, her bare feet borne west on their slick black fish backs, their sharpish maws opening for to, for to shriek their underwater psalms loudly enough that Gittel could hear them calling in voices waterish familiar, sweet one, beloved one, tired one, blessed be your tired feet. Over the subdued wind and under the salt glass slice of the water and the soft, soft dark sluice of the murk, what was overlapping their backs as they flapped forward and under their bellies as they leaped over the face of the deep and gray. 
A small flaming blackbird led the way like a needle and thread sewn through the sky, and Gittel down lay to rest her head on the backs of the creatures, their soft, smooth skin flickering underneath her cheek and above their muscles, right on the border between the water and the their water. And yo, on the other side of the Atlantis wetness, sat plump and bespectacled America. The blackbirds down flopped dead onto land, smoldering heaps of feather and fine bone. Two by two, the porpoises swam away into the grayscape, shrieking as they swam. And Gittel was left to stagger alone like a drunken ham until the edges of her new stepfather's bepoisoned and snakesome garden, holding in her hands a paper invitation hewn from a tree, wishing she could hold instead the hands of her siblings hewn from the wind. Yeah, and of course, Gittel, sibling ours, we are all wishing this. Awa. What's your name? said America. Gittel Chayelez said Gittel. Incomprehensible, said America. Gittel Zhitomirsky, then, said Gittel. Gittel Felstiner, Gittel Berdichevsky, Gittel Skwiraski, Gittel Proskurover, Gittel Zatelsky, Gittel Rechitaski, Gertie Radish, said America. There we are. Nothing, said Gittel. Oh, Jewess, said America. Lose the sourpuss, you made it. Mazel tov cocktails for all, and what's in a name after all? Look at me, Tata Vespucius, indeed. No Oedipal complex to be had at all, woof, given the dad was basically born dead in terms of significance. What? And still, I did all right for myself, right? Didn't I? You can smell the leather in my eye sockets. Here, smell, nice, right? Scraped either from a Jersey cow or from some red-finned member of the Garment Workers Union or other. Isn't that right, Gertie? You've got no intentions, I'm sure. Anyway, enough about you. My, my essence, of course, is dentistry. In the course of no time at all, I sank my thankful milky teeth into the belly of this other fellow, coated my molars with his flesh, daintily tugged his molars from his mouth's flesh, and he barely yelped, Gertie, for they do have a much higher pain tolerance, biologically speaking. And I dribbled his warm mouth blood all over my pretty garden, and now, gosh darn it, Jewess, would you look at all that corn? I warned my daughters of his ways and then started a school and built a town, and then another kept his teeth tucked away in my cheek for good luck, called it a day or two in good grief. What do we got? A room for you, Gertie. A room of your own. A room that I built all by my lonesome. No help at all. Look away from my face. I'd strongly recommend that you, ha, ahem, look at the pictures on the wall, would ya? Gittel vomited. Don't look too long, though. As I was saying, lose the sourpuss. Not a good look in these parts. You've jewed your way in here, and good on you, Gertie. Good on you, Radish. I'm a big fan of initiative. You're here to peruse your happiness or something like that, right? Right. Now do a little twirl for me, would ya? At a girl. At a Gertie. You'll like it here, I'm sure of it. Here, have a tooth. Gittel stood still as America off picked all her lice, muttering to itself under its vinegar and room nut breath. And somewhere was the sound of a bell clanging inside a wintersome nostril. And every now and then, America paused to scratch the undersides of its eyelids with one of its 13 tongues. And then it was finished, and so deloused, Gittel grabbed hold of a collection of dust motes and border moths, what to use as currency, and was then muscled onto a train, and fell there into sleep. And she slept for longer than she almost ever slept, for hours, yo, or at least for a long hour. Arrived to Philadelphia, Gittel awoke. I'll stop there. Bring my pile of books. That was lovely. Uh, what I you forgot to mention was the Goodreads commenter was none other than Kanye West. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't want to make him feel bad. Yeah, I mean he's had a week. Uh, anyways, thank you for schlepping out from Philly, uh, and we were going to talk about that first, but then I started thinking about something because you were talking about about language and and the the, the translation. Uh, somebody think it was a bad translation, but to me, the thing that got me, I was like, okay, when you go into a novel, you're like, here's, I want story first. I'm like, where's the story? But the language grabs me so fast because I'm like, oh, this is, play he's playing with a lot of stuff here. Um, and it's fascinating. And I was wondering, how does your, your work as a poet inform your work as a novelist? Thank you for that question. So the... The genesis of this book um, came actually from a book of poetry. Mm -hmm. um, I was at McDowell, an artist residency in New Hampshire, 
and had just finished final edits on my first novel. And someone, you know, probably the same person who gave me the advice not to look at Goodreads, had also given me the advice that when, you're, when your first novel comes out, make sure you're working on a second novel so you don't spend all your time looking at Goodreads. <laughs> um, and I took their advice in that case. And so I said, you know, what should I work on? What should I do? And so I was wandering around. It was this snowy February evening, um, February 2017. Um, and in their library, um, I found this book um, by, by edited and translated by Ru Ruth Whitman, um, who had been a fellow there in 1963. Wow. And so I sort of opened it and read a few of the poems out loud on the right side of the page, right, on the English side of the page. And I remember feeling this feeling, and so I'll read, I'll read a snippet of it. The, these, these lines, this is Jacob Glotstein. Um, All the children, astonished, ran to meet the fear of death without tears, like little Jewish bedtime stories, and soon they flickered into flames like small namesakes of God. And reading these poems, and then there's, there's Anna Margolin. Um, I once was a youth who listened at the arcades to Socrates. I had a bosom friend, my beloved, who possessed the most beautiful torso in Athens. And then there was Caesar, who built a glittering world of marble. I was the last one left, and my proud sister was elected to be my wife. Wearing wreaths of roses, drinking till all hours, in peace and high spirits, I heard about the pansy from Nazareth and the mad deeds of the Jews. And so reading these poems, reading Margolin, reading Glatstein in particular, I felt this sense of family, um, the sense that these were ancestors, but not in the parochial sense. Not that they were ancestors just because my ancestors also spoke Yiddish. Not that they were ancestors because they were writing in this language that would have been the mother tongue of my great-grandparents also. But ancestors on a deeper sense. Ancestors on a literary sense. Ancestors on the level of they, these folks are working in the world of poetry that I want to be working in. And so from that moment, I sort of said, well, I'll, I'll set out to write in conversation with them. And for me, that... This might be getting ahead of, uh, ahead of us, but everything, you know, everything circles back. Yeah, I could just throw this out. <laughs> um, that, to me, is the, is the offering of poetry and a fiction that, that leans on poetry, um, is the possibility of time not being a line, the possibility of what happened after not superseding and trampling what came before, the possibility of being in conversation with Jacob Glotstein, being in conversation with Anna Margolin, even though I'm writing in February 2017 and they were writing in 1930, writing in 1940. Um, but when you're writing, when you're writing in conversation with poets, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that they aren't alive anymore. Their words are alive. It doesn't matter that they're not sitting in this snowy, you know, this cabin in the snow next to me, because in some senses they were. Yeah. So that was this moment. Um, these, these poems, these two in particular, um, were the sparking moment of this novel. And actually, Yankif Glatstein and Ruth Whitman's translation is the, are the beginning words on the epigraph of the, of the novel. I kiss you, disheveled Jewish life. Now, now being from Israel originally, uh, we, we talked about this a little bit, but I don't think, I don't know if everybody understands that uh, Yiddish for, I mean, I don't know now, but when, the, when Israel was being founded, Yiddish wasn't very popular. And at the same time in America, Yiddish wasn't very popular. We, we kind of discussed this. But can you explain why? Because I'm not sure if everybody understands uh, the, the Israeli connection to Yiddish. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, I read these poems only on the right side of the page. Um, I grew up loathing Yiddish. Um, I thought it was, at best, humorous, and at worst, disgusting. Um, and that wasn't sort of some uniqueness to my own upbringing or some uniqueness to my own Jewish experience. There was this way in which Yiddish faced with these very different, but in some ways, twinned um, loathements, if I may. Um, where in the Israeli context, Yiddish was framed as the language of the diaspora, bent back sheep to slaughter who didn't sufficiently resist the Nazis, who in some ways perhaps even deserved what they got because they weren't strong, they weren't muskil yudin, they weren't muscle Jews as, as the Zionist movement advocated they be. And in America, um, Yiddish was, was too Jewish. Yeah. Right? Yiddish was an identifier as, you know, as, as 
as Jew, essentially, and my grandparents, for example, their parents were all native Yiddish speakers, and they grew up barely knowing Yiddish because they had this option, and especially after World War II, right, especially after the Holocaust, um, both in Israel and in America, the, the loathing of Yiddish took almost a, a cemented form, mm -hmm. um, where in America, Jews saw this kind of opening in the American racial nightmare and say perhaps you know white skinned Jews could perhaps pass as white after World War II and then in Israel there you know with the founding of the state with the creation of Israel as a state for Jews only um, there was this idea that Yiddish was a symbol of the past was a was a badge of shame which should be scorned and looked down upon and so I didn't know I barely knew a word of Yiddish I knew schlep and shtip and schmuck and that's about it and then reading these poets I said wait a second you know these poets shouldn't only be interesting for me because I have grandparents or great-grandparents who spoke Yiddish these are poets who are doing work that I would argue is as interesting as any poets working in the 19th and 20th century and yet it's cordoned off. It said, you know, if you know these names, it's because you're a scholar of Yiddish. If you know these names, it's because you're in the, the academy. Um, and I felt, you know, I wanted to know these poets because I'm a lover of poetry, but also I wanted to be able to know these poets in the language they were writing. So as I set out to write this novel simultaneous to the, to the writing, I also started to learn Yiddish. Mm -hmm. and, and to sort of turn back to these poems, um, now when I look at the page, it's not only what I read before, but it's also alle kleine Kinder seinen verwundert, gelaufen dem Teutschreck erkegen, ungewöhnen, ungewöhnen, wie verwigte jüdische Meiselech kleine, und bald haben sie aufgeflackert in Flemlech wie kleine Adeschemlech. And the language doesn't sound absurd to me. Mm. It doesn't sound shameful to me. I'm not embarrassed as I read it. And, and for that, I'm, I'm grateful. I have to ask because um, I'm always fascinated by things lost in translation. Mm -hmm. And having heard Yiddish growing up as a child but not really knowing it, um, I'm wondering how much is lost in translation? Like from, I mean, because I've read plenty of Yiddish fiction, I've read, it is, you know, you can't really replicate that feeling, the way you're reading it, because <laughs> that is really what Yiddish is all about, is it's feeling. Um, well, you can't, but I tried. Yeah. <laughs> and part of the project of this book, and so I started writing the book before I knew Yiddish. Yeah. I started writing the book before I, before I knew Yiddish, and then I decided to pause for a while. You know, I, re I wrote in what I thought might be the syntax. I wrote and I thought what might be the kind of metatextual elements. I wrote in what I thought was the rhythm of the language. And then I said, you know, let's pause for a few years and make sure I'm getting this right. Um, I took an intensive course at Tel Aviv University. I traveled to central Belarus with uh, the Yiddishkeit Fellowship. Actually, we may have been one of the last group, big groups of Americans to go to central Belarus in, in late 2019. Um, obviously, in 2020, with the revolution there, they aren't letting in groups of visitors. Um, and, and in learning Yiddish, I sort of sunk even deeper into this effort to to translate the syntax, to translate the feeling, to translate that which is untouchable in the language. And I think there's this discourse, the one I read before between Charles and Gittel, in which Charles says, well, maybe there's something essential to Yiddish. Maybe there's something essential to the language that is untranslatable, that you can't put forward in any language but Yiddish. And Gittel kind of pushes back and says, I don't think so. Yeah. You know, I think that the, the thing that all tongues are upground human fish, as she says. Um, and so there's this debate between these two characters, which is the privilege of writing a novel that I don't have to decide how I feel, um, <laughs> that w whether there's something untranslatable about the Yiddish or not. Um, I think the book is an effort to translate the syntax and to be accessible to someone who knows not a word of Yiddish. Um, and I think often, I thought often in writing this book about Arundhati Roy, the novelist, who in an interview I heard say something like, and I'm, I'm summarizing here, um, her novels also include a lot of non-English languages transliterated into English and references and cultural moments that will be totally legible for some and totally illegible for others. And she said in her interview that, that the novels, her novels are to be seen as a sea or as an ocean. And some fish swim closer to the, to the ocean floor and they'll see this word in a language and it'll conjure for them this word from a poem and that word from a prayer and that word from a cultural context. And other fish swim closer to the surface and they won't understand those transliter transliterated words. They won't necessarily get all the references there. Um, but there's not a better place for a fish to swim in the ocean. There's not a superior way to swim through a book. 
both of those reading experiences are equally valid. And in some ways, actually, there is a privilege of being someone who doesn't understand all of the, all of the Yiddish words or any of the Yiddish words, because then you get to encounter the sound. You get to encounter, encounter the syntax. You get to encounter what it, look, what it feels like on your tongue to say maise, what it feels like on your tongue to say taive, which out, without knowing that maise means story, without knowing that taive means lust. Um, because does it mean just that? And I think that's, again, the, the question that poetry forces us to ask is, are words only the sum of their meaning? Or is there something, something deeper, more musical, stranger to words, that it's also the sounds, the consonants bounce, bouncing off each other, the way the syllables roll off one another? Um, so, I, so I think that the, the knowledge of Yiddish is absolutely not a prerequisite for, for any moment of reading this book. You know, one of the things, and I, and I, I love Yiddish, so I, I, this is not an insult, but I, I, whenever I hear, and this is, it's always somebody like very, oh, I mean, what's, very goyish looking to me, usually. They're like, it's such a beautiful language. And I'm like, eh, eh, I mean, uh, it's, it's funny. And it's, I, I, I mean, I'm not, whatever, it's a language. It's, I love it. But um, I, don't, I don't, I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's what it is. And I love that. But um, what, I, what fascinated me with this book, and I honestly was like scratching my head. I'm like, OK, I've read his first novel. I've read some of his poetry. And not to go back to the Goodreads comment that Kanye West wrote, um, no, he didn't write it. Uh, sorry. Uh, I, I, literally, I literally was like, is this a translation? Because this is, it, the, the tone was what got me. I was fascinated with it. I was like, this is like if a man or a writer whose first language was Yiddish tried to translate a Yiddish story into English. Because you get this tone and it's so rich. And so, and I was, and this is like the dorkiest, most like, um, like craft question, but how did you get the tone? Like how much did you have to like work to get like the little like broken English, Yiddish, like how, how much re like revisions? And I don't always like to ask writers this question, but I was legitimately fascinated by this because I was like, wow, this is a crazy book. I love this. And I mean that with the highest amount of respect. Thank you. So early on in the process, um, I sent a few chapters to my agent, Julia Cardin. And she said, you know, I think there's something going on here. I think there is something interesting happening here. And I have an editor who I might send it to. And um, she sent it to Jenna Johnson, um, who's here today. And Jenna read these pages and said, I agree, there's something interesting going on here. There is something interesting happening in the language. And I think we'd probably need to do three or four rounds, maybe two or three years of work on this book. Are you up for that? Um, and I said, am I up for that? And I fell out of my chair. I, it, 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 it sounds like a dream. Yeah. Um, and one of the first things Jenna did with me was to push me um, to, to make sure that everything had infrastructure for me. That there wasn't anything in the book that was just me kind of riffing in the world of nonsense, sort of scribbling down my dreams and saying like, okay, like I think maybe there's something here. <laughs> Don't look too closely. And sometimes um, Jenna would push on a line or a word and say like, well, what does this mean? And I'd say, no idea. <laughs> Don't know what I'm doing there. Don't know what it references. Don't know why it's there. And then we would cut those things. And the other things I would say, actually, ah, here, this project is um, borrowing a certain verb structure from Yiddish. Or here, these are the voices of the malochim, the, the angels, the siblings, um, intervening and, and making decisions uh, as to what were the frames, what were the sort of infrastructure that I would give the book, and then following that. And, and it ended up, indeed, taking uh, six revisions over the, <laughs> over the course of um, the first few years of the pandemic, the entirety of Donald Trump's presidency, too. And, um, and then, and, and this is where we are at. A nice pandemic project. <laughs> I believe it was either that or sourdough. Like. <laughs> I did at one point. I did at one point um, throw away my my housemate's sourdough because I thought I thought I thought the jar had rotted. I threw away their their starter. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. I feel like that could turn into like an old Yiddish story where the sourdough comes back to haunt you. <laughs> like, why did you throw me out? <laughs> Uh, it also feels impeccably researched. Like, I mean, I, I am a, a 
a nerd when it comes to this stuff. And I was like, oh, this feels legitimately like the Jewish experience in a fictionalized, how much research did you do? Like, mm. where did the, and again, if you hate craft talk, you're at the Center for Fiction, I apologize. <laughs> this is what they do here. So I'm very curious about the, the research for this book because it feels very, you know. Yeah. Um, so starting on the, the number level, um, if anyone here, I imagine some people here, saw the galley of this book. And in the back, there's a kind of, there's a moment that says, leave seven pages for notes and acknowledgement. And then I started to <laughs> compile the notes and acknowledgements. And I said, uh oh, folks, we have a problem. They said, we could give you a few more pages. And then we made the font a lot smaller. <laughs> um, so folks will see that in the back, I wanted to, to name um, not all, but many of the books, the poems, the films, I read, the people I talked to, the folks I interviewed, the places I went, because this book um, stands on the back of a lot of other books. And as you saw, I, I, brought, I brought a stack of books up here. I'm not sure whether I'll reference all of them, but, but I wanted them to be next to me as I talked about this book. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's a mistake um, and a, um, yeah, an insult to the craft of fiction when folks so I sort of say, like, oh, I don't, you don't need to research so hard. Imagine it. And if you get some things wrong, you get some things wrong. And that, to me, is, is a betrayal of what this project is. Um, so there are some moments <laughs> in this book where I, you know, I worked with a, a friend, um, Rob adler Pekarar, and a Yiddish mentor. And we together came up with the dialect of the book, the Yiddish dialect. Right, so it combines elements of the Polish dialect of Yiddish with the Lithuanian dialect of Yiddish, is placed specifically in this area of northeastern Ukraine, so that it would make sense that it would be the site of some of these horrific Ukrainian nationalist pogroms that took place during the period of the Ru Russian Revolution, but not too far south, so that some of the pronunciations of names wouldn't be altered. And we sort of, you know, we, we ended up having this wild, sprawling discourse, and in the end we said, you know, one and a half people are going to care about this. That's 75% that's of each of us. Right? Neither of us can even, could even fully um, remember what were some of the nuances we decided on, on dialect. But it mattered to me. It mattered to me that these speakers, um, if they were to be read by someone, from, someone near the fictional shtetl of Zatelsk, they'd be speaking correctly. They'd, their, their accents would be right. They'd be saying meshke and not moshke. Actually, Moshele instead of Moshke, because Moshke, the ke suffix, is a, a Lithuanian um, nickname rather than a Polish nickname. And onwards. I, I, could, I could go on no, with for a while. No, the Litvok stuff, like, I'm always like, wow. I, like, I've talked to uh, Litvish. What, what Litvish? Lit, yeah. yeah. I've talked to people who speak it, and I'm like, what are you saying? Uh, <laughs> my grandfather's from Romania. My other grandparents. It's like they all speak different kinds of dialects, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, this is crazy. And, most books that have Yiddish are so lazy, it's just like for an American audience. So, you know, that's, that's right. And, and, I, and I think that there is this sense of, well, who's going to check? Right? If I were writing a book that was halfway in Spanish, then half the people in this room could check my Spanish. If I were writing a book that were you know, partially in Hebrew, then probably not half the people in this room, but some people could check my Hebrew. But who's going to check the Yiddish? Right? There's that question, who's going to check? Why not? Why not just you know, make up a system of transliteration or not even be consistent with my transliteration? Why not just you know, throw a few Yiddish words in there and italicize them um, for, for flavor, for spice? And I will, you know, folks will note that in this book, like in my first book, all of the Yiddish words are unitalicized um, so that they are not seen as, as unessential. I know that as a reader, when I read words I don't understand in italics, oftentimes I'll recoil and say, well, I don't know, and I'll just sort of skip, skip ahead to comma, however they translate it in English. Or if there's no translation, I'll just skip the words entirely. And for me, the non-italicization of the Yiddish words is an invitation to readers. And of course, I can't control how anyone reads the book. But it's an invitation to readers to see these words as no less essential than the English words or Yinglish words that surround the Yiddish on either side. I like, who will check the Yiddish sounds like a Cynthia Ozick short story. I like that. Um, uh, what was that? Was that Q and A? Q and A. Can I ask one more? I got one more. And then, uh, so much of Jewish fiction. I mean, we've been through some stuff. The Jews. I don't know if you've heard this, uh, but you know, there's so much trauma associated with our stories, but also that go into the fiction. And I'm wondering, and I always wonder this whenever I read uh, any Jewish. Themed. I don't want to say Jewish novel because I, I know uh, some people don't like that term, but I, um, 
I always wonder the attachment the writer has because it's this, there's a lot of tragedy in our, in our DNA and I wonder what did you get attached to and what, what brought out the emotion in you while writing this? What was it that really got you? Maybe I'll read, read a little section there as, as an answer to that. Um, and this is Gittel remembering her siblings. <clears throat> and she waited for her siblings to respond, but they did not respond. And she remembered then how she had gone into her home after the clan of death came and had found her siblings there, how she had brushed a feather of hair from Reza's face and asked for her to wake, but how she did not wake. Once there was a Jew which was called Gittel, and Gittel sat amidst the pile of her siblings. And... I think for me it was these moments where the clear lines of history begin to blur and the sort of clarity of my seatedness in the present begins to dissolve into my absorption of the past um, in which my grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents stories aren't kind of incidental anecdotes mm -hmm. that I would throw out at a dinner party, but rather parts of who I am and parts of how I move through the world. And yeah, and I think the attachment was allowing um, time to bend, and allowing myself to, to exist in a, in a time space that wasn't bounded only in the now. I like that. It's beautiful. Uh, so now we have a couple, we have time for a couple of questions. I'll let you. Just raise your hand, we'll bring a mic. And tell me your name. For, wait for the microphone, please. Microphone. My name is Ilana, and I wanted to, first of all, thank you. Thank you both, and thank you for a marvelous presentation, which made me incredibly excited about uh, getting and reading your book, though I swore I'm not buying any more books. But, uh, <laughs> it's a problem we all have. Yeah. So, um, the, my question is really kind of off sides, uh, which is about the transliteration. And the reason is that there is kind of official transliteration of Yiddish or of uh, Hebrew that is used in the libraries, mm -hmm. yeah, for cataloging. It's, it's a wonderful question and one that I grappled with for a while. I went back and forth between using the official standardized YIVO transliteration of Yiddish um, and deciding ultimately that because this book is such an oral book, is such a book about sound, is about specifically how a, a word sounds when it lands on your ear and also about dialect, that thinking about um, a character or a real, a real writer named Moishe Kulbach. Moishe Kulbach was a beloved Yiddish communist novelist and poet who was eventually executed in the Stalinist purges in 1936. And, but his name wasn't Moishe. In standardized YIVO transliteration, it has to be Moishe, but his name was Meishe. His name was Meishe in Lithuanian, and so for me, Meishe had to supersede Moishe, even though I was straying from the standardized transliteration in so doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Tells me a lot about the art of writing. Thank you. Hi, Morielle. That was a wonderful, wonderful reading and discussion. Um, I was impressed by your use of the word infrastructure and the discipline as this, uh, in answer to this woman's question, around precisely what dialect of Yiddish you were going to use, if only for your own belief, right, in the, in the character who cares. You care. We care. So for the Malachim, is it Malachim? Malachim. Or Malachim. 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 There you go. Malachim. <laughs> um, I, I would ask what considerations, what criteria um, did you, how did you decide the specificity 
of the rules of their appearance, disappearance, mm -hmm. speech, lack of speech? Gosh, I'm, I love that question. I feel I'm giggling here up on stage. Um, so the Malochim have very, very strict rules of what they can and can't do. Um, they all only speak in one line. Sometimes the line breaks over into a second, but is specifically indented. There's no punctuation. They're never, they're never translated. So some of the text, as it's presented as a, as a manuscript, um, there will be footnotes throughout the text. In the end, I think there are 100 of them. At some point, there were 340. <laughs> and there was, I got some good advice to take out some of them. I don't need to give, give a whole discourse on whether or not one adds the H at the end of Lush and Kaidish words that are derived from Aramaic. Let it be. <laughs> um, but with the Malochim, they're never footnoted. Um, and that, for me, is a very... It's, it's a fine elements, and I feel like I may be revealing too much, and I apologize if I am doing so, but I'll do it here in this, in this sort of special launch event, that that for me allows this porousness as to whether they exist in the text or outside of the text, um, whether they are to be read as part of Gittel's writing or as external to Gittel's writing, commenting on Gittel's writing. And I wanted to leave that question open for the reader, so there are never footnotes that touch the Malochim um, and that never touch their speech, and they're never translated either. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Other folks? I think we have time for one more. M one more. One more. Who, who we got? Again, a wonderful presentation. My name is Daniel Tamulonis. I'm really curious about the character of Charles and how he came to be in the book. If you'd say a little bit about him, mm -hmm. please. Sure. Um, so there were very few things I knew when I set out to write this book. I knew I wanted to write toward conversation with Yankif Glatstein and with Anna Margolin, with these Yiddish poets. And so I knew I wanted to have something, something around Yiddish. Um, second, I knew I wanted the book to touch on my own family, um, to be in conversation with my own family. And so my grandparents, um, who I was very close to, they were some of the most beloved people in my life, um, Esther and Phil, um, grew up in Philadelphia. And so, I, set, so I, I said, I'll set it in Philadelphia. I'll set it where they grew up. And my grandmother, um, growing up, I knew that my grandmother had a sister. Um, and her sister lived in Center City in Philadelphia. We would visit her sometimes, um, Beatrice. Um, and only when I was in my late teenage years, and I see some members of my family here, so I'm looking at you as I, as I tell this. Only in my late teenage years did I find out that my grandmother had had a second sister, um, their youngest sibling, Leonor. Um, and I only found out, I only heard snippets of this story. And there was something in Leonor's story that as a young woman in Philadelphia, she had a child with a black man, very soon after this was institutionalized, and the child was adopted by a staff member of the institution. Um, and that's all, that's all that I knew. And so when trying to talk to my grandmother about this, she was unable to do so. She was a woman of, of composure, of grace, of generosity, of immense humor. But this was something that she made very clear she was not able and not willing to talk about with me. Um, and so after she died, I felt this sense of a little more freedom that I could try to figure out who this family member was, what happened, was the staff member of the institution acting out of altruism? Was it something more nefarious? Was it something adjacent to kidnapping? Did my aunt need to be institutionalized? Um, was it an institutionalization based on the nightmare of American racism? Um, all of those questions, I, I found no answers. I'm not a great, uh, I'm, a, I'm a good researcher in the sense that I read a lot of books. I'm a good researcher in the sense that I, I like talking to people and listening to stories. I'm not a good researcher in the sense that I don't know I don't know from archives. You know, I don't know from getting this guy to do a favor for me because his cousin knew my cousin's mother. So I, I couldn't find anything. I couldn't, I couldn't even find records of my aunt having been institutionalized, nothing. And perhaps there's someone out there who could do this better than me. Um, so I didn't find anything. But then ultimately, I'm not a nonfiction writer. I'm not a journalist. Um, I'm, a, I'm a novelist. So I thought I'd, I'd write something toward that story. And then in trying to imagine that story, I, imagined, I tried to ask you know, who who was my aunt, um, who is this, this child's father, 
um, and then sort of imagining, and again, this, this story has nothing to do with the, the sort of slim details that I was able to glean from, from my family's um, actual stories, but then imagining what it would be like, what, what would a relationship like between, be between a black man and an Ashkenazi white Jewish woman in Philadelphia in the 1930s? And that became an animating question. And as I followed that question, the characters of Charles and Gittel um, and Leib all formed out of that. Although Leib is a little more mysterious. He doesn't have any kind of basing in that story. He's this strange uh, ethereal figure. His name means lion. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's give him a big hand. <laughs> Marielle, I think we should bring you back for a dramatic reading of the whole novel. I would so do it. Great. <laughs> On that note, um, if you want a dramatic reading of the whole novel, go over to Audible. Um, I, re I read the audiobook. Uh, <laughs> so. um, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, the books are at the bookstore, and then Marielle will be over here um, personalizing books. So if you already have your copy and you want your copy personalized, you just want to say hi to him. Um, you'll line up uh, by through coming through this aisle here. And when you go get your book, come back through the back door and get in line that way too. All right. Um, again, thanks. All, thank you all for coming. Thanks for you uh, folks joining us on YouTube. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. Of course. Oh, really wonderful. Where should I sit? Where do I sit? Demike me.